uh, daylight savings time. So the result of this is a very early morning for him. And we're grateful for, to him for giving up some of his sleep to be with us here tonight, this morning, however you view it. So thank you very much for your time here. Um, I will turn the time over to him in just a minute as soon as I give a couple of introduction things. And then after that, we will, um, we will start with a word of prayer. Actually, if I can ask Brother Gerard to pray for us in a minute or two. Um, let me say something. So are a couple of things. Um, so as we're getting into the end-ish of the course now, uh, we've got this lecture. Next lecture is going to be a different one. Dr. Talbert, Leighton Talbert, is giving us that lecture. It'll be excellent. Um, he was one of my one of my uh, favorite teachers when I was in seminary and continues to be so. So we'll enjoy that very much. However, he is going to do it for us pre-recorded, -re -pre as in not live. So we have an option here. Um, if you would be interested in, we could do the same time and we could just stream it and then actually watching the video together, then we, you know, we'd be able to comment and interact and stuff like that as we went. That's completely an option. Um, or if you would prefer, it's just as good by me. If I just give you the link, you walk, watch it when it makes sense for you. And then we can interact. Uh, actually, we can interact on the Moodle page if you want, if you have questions or thoughts you know, maybe drop them in there and I'll create a form for us to do that. We can do some discussion there. Okay, so anyway, if you can give me some interaction, if I do watch it at the same time next week, Monday night, or whatever time that time is for you, would you want to come in? Or if you would prefer just to do it asynchronously, just do it on your own time. Let me know in the comments here. That'll give me an idea of whether it's something I should set up. Either way, I will drop the link into the Moodle page so you can just grab it there. Okay, last thing to say here before we go is, um, or before we get started, is uh, I need your questions. So as you know, traditionally our last lecture has been um, just interacting with some questions that you've given me. And so there is a forum on the Moodle page. Uh, some of you have asked some great questions, uh, but yeah, I would like to get questions from everybody, really, if I can. So if you could do that for me, if you have questions from anywhere in the entire course or even a topic that we haven't discussed, um, anything, really, something that we weren't able to come to just within the purview of apologetics, then I'll do my best either to dig up information myself or find somebody who has some information to answer your question. Okay, uh, so please make sure you take the time to do that in the next couple of days, preferably, and uh, that would be great. Brother Gerard, if you're able to lead us in prayer, and then after that, Dr. Riley, we're looking forward to what you have for us. Okay, uh, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to you for this course. Lord, we pray for Dr. Riley, and Lord, as he once again minister to us your precious word. Lord, we pray you help us to uh, think more maturely and Lord, even uh, with the goal of reaching out to the lost, Lord, we pray you equip us with the necessary tools that we can serve you effectively. Lord, we command the rest of the time to your loving hand. We pray for your blessed presence to be with us. We thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> all right. It's good to be back with you this morning. As uh, as Joel was saying, it's uh, it's six in the morning local time here, and uh, and 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 not only is it six in the morning um, uh, at, uh, in Celsius, which I think is what the rest of you are using, it's just below zero here, and uh, and so far. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've gotten, again, metric system, about half a meter of snow already. Um, so uh, win winter is upon us here. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and for us, it will, be, it will be winter with snow on the ground until uh, at least April. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're settled in for a long, long winter here. I, I know uh, there's probably, are there, is, is anyone here never seen snow? Is it, is that, uh, I, I, I would guess there's probably some that probably have never been in snow. Um, yeah, we're, we're up in the, the very, uh, about as north as you can get in the continental United States. Um, so 
Anyway, it's good to be good to be back, and I'm looking forward to our topic here this morning: practical use of apologetics. So uh, I just want to start um, start with this. Yeah, we actually have a couple of ski hills by us. In fact, uh, near us, um, uh, you can Google this uh, some other time. There's a place called Copper Peak. It's a ski flying hill. Um, I, I don't know exactly how tall it is, but it's it's outrageously tall where they built a platform on top of a hill. Um, and I wouldn't ever, ever, ever go down that because that's insane. Um, anyway, um, what I want to do as we, we begin this morning, uh, practical use of apologetics, um, just a little sort of a little autobiographical uh, snippet here as we begin. Um, I mentioned before, I, I pastor um, what would be considered uh, here a relatively small church. On a, on a Sunday morning, we have about 50 or so folks um, in our church, and we're in a very, very uh, rural area. Um, we had, uh, I have a good friend of mine who is headed to Hong Kong to plant churches, and he's a friend of mine from from Arizona. He was at the Bible College that I was I was there. And when he came to our church to present his mission work, one of the things he does when he presents his his um, his his work is he takes Hong Kong and overlays it on the local map to get an idea of the size of Hong Kong compared to wherever he is presenting his work. And and uh, so. For us, it was particularly striking because Hong Kong sits in the county in which I live. And if I'm remembering correctly, in Hong Kong, there's about 7 million people. In my county, there's about 16,000 in the same area. Um, and, and so I live in a very rural area. Um, you know, I'm not near any cities. Um, and I, and I have a, a relatively small church. And, 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 and one of the questions I get asked from time to time is, um, do you feel it was worthwhile to get a PhD in apologetics for the ministry you're in? Right? That, that I've got this advanced degree in what would be considered in many cases a very specialized and somewhat obscure topic. Um, was it a worthwhile um, degree for, for pastoral ministry. And, and, and maybe there's, there's a part of me that's just defending what I've done. Uh, but the reality is I, I am so happy to have the degree that I have for the ministry that I'm doing, because I'm going to overstate this just a little bit. Ministry in many ways is apologetics. And, and, and the reason I say that is this, um, so we often think of apologetics as almost exclusively aimed at unbelievers. But we recognize that when we teach uh, a class on apologetics, um, oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, is my email address uh, on, on course documents, Joel, or um, can I just put that in here? Sure. Um, yeah, drop it. If you, yeah, if you want to, anyone who wants to get a hold of me, there's, there's my email address. Um, we, we think of apologetics as being aimed at unbelievers. Um, but here's, here's the reality. You as a bunch of believers sitting in a, in an apologetics class, you know that this is helpful for your own faith. You know that if you teach an apologetics class in your church, um, that only, that not only equips them to go do evangelism, but it also helps strengthen their own faith. Right. And, and in that way, apologetics isn't, just about unbelievers it's about believers too and I, I want you to think of uh, think of it this way um uh, I, I suppose one of the challenges of a class like this um uh, that we've had multiple teachers uh throughout is i don't know what everyone else has said um but let me let me make an argument that i i uh, resist strongly defining faith as believing something you don't have evidence for right? That, that is it's a really common definition of faith. Um, people uh, think of faith as, okay, this is the stuff we've got evidence for, and faith is where you have to kind of leap beyond the evidence to believe something 
that you don't have good reasons for, that you don't have good evidence for. I think that is a, a horrendous definition of faith. Um, it is very common. Um, it is it is assumed, especially by a lot of unbelievers, that when you talk about faith, you're talking about faith because you don't have evidence for that. It's not a biblical definition of faith. Um, I don't know how this works in in all of the languages uh, you guys speak, but I I, um, I you know if if I had uh, veto power over the English language, uh, I wish that we hadn't taken the Greek words for faith and belief, which are the same word, and translated them into two different English words of faith and belief. Because um, what, what happens in English is believe is a pretty ordinary word. I believe a, a variety of things. I believe that someone told me this. Faith sounds spiritual and sounds disconnected from ordinary belief. But the reality is, in, in the New Testament, they're the same words, right? Um, what it means to have faith in the New Testament is to believe that what God says is true. And, and um, because God is God, believing what God says is the single most rational thing you can do, right? God, by definition, can't be wrong. God can never be wrong because God is God. And, and so... Um, you know, we, we, there are times where uh, people resist the idea of um, uh, something being believable on the basis of authority, but we all do it, right? Um, we, we, we wonder if such and such a thing is true, and so we bump onto Wikipedia to check it out, right? And, and, or whatever source it is that you look at. And the reality is, even though you've gone and looked it up online, you still don't have firsthand uh, contact with whatever it is that you were you were searching for, you're still taking it on authority, right? And that's fine. That's a good thing, right? There's a lot of stuff we believe on authority. The ultimate authority in the universe is God, right? And what it means to grow in faith is to is to grow in my belief, my settled confidence that whatever God says is true. You understand this is the heart of not only conversion, but of sanctification, right? Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, the, the, the American pastor, John Piper. I've got uh, things about him I, I like. There's things about him I, 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 I'm a little uneasy about. But um, one of the things that I think he gets well is that um, he, 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 he makes the case that when we're tempted to sin, the temptation of sin is that sin is making promises to us, right? It's promising good to us. And in that moment in which we're faced with temptation, what we have is that sin is making promises of good to us and that God is making promises of good to us. And the question is, at that moment, who will we believe? Do you understand that that is a fight for faith? Um, I, I told folks in our church on a regular basis, um, in, 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 in many ways, it is a more, re, more potent act of faith that when someone uh, wrongs you, that you don't wrong them back, than it would be to travel to the other side of the globe to preach the gospel, right? We tend to have this mindset that a great act of faith is doing this profound, big work for God. The reality is when someone wrongs me and I trust God to vindicate his saints so that I don't have to strike back or, or say something back to them in the moment, do you understand that that's an act of faith? I am believing what God has said, that he is a God who does justice. He is a God who vindicates his saints. And my holding my tongue in that moment is faith. The reason I say all that is if we understand that apologetics is the whole discipline of, of how to uh, communicate to others their need for faith in God, you start understanding that all ministry is apologetics. Right? Does that make sense? That, that what I do from week to week in the pulpit of my church 
is I am getting up and I'm saying, thus says the Lord, and this is why you must believe what I am, I am pleading with you. I am appealing to you to believe what God has said. And I don't just say that when I go outside my church and speak to unbelievers. That's my Sunday sermon. It's an appeal for faith. Um, when I um, uh, wrestle through a difficult passage, right, um, to wins not not last night, but um, the Wednesday before that, um, our, our uh, Wednesday prayer meeting gathering, we're going through the book of First Samuel. And we got to God's command to Saul to uh, exterminate the Amalekites, right? That's the sort of passage that even Christians struggle with, right? How, how can this be good? How can this be just of God? You understand at that moment when you're trying to help your people understand why it is just for God to command Saul, uh, uh, let me give you the short answer, at least as I see it, um, uh, is God's final judgment in Revelation. When, when Jesus comes in judgment and judges the whole world and condemns the, the uh, reprobate and delivers his saints, is that justice? And the answer is yes, right? That is final justice. If that is justice, it remains just for God to do that at any time in history. That the conquest of Canaan, for instance, is, is, is essentially a preview of, it, it, here, here is the first Joshua, the first Jesus, right? Same name. Conquering the land and putting to death the adversaries of the people of God. Well, that's exactly what happens at the end of Revelation. Right. As Jesus comes again and he conquers the land and he puts to death the adversaries. And and if now, obviously, unbelievers object to both. Right. But if you're if you're doing apologetics with believers and they're wrestling with how can God say kill the man, women and children. Right. How can God be just and say that? Well, well, if you understand God's final judgment, you can understand God's temporal judgment. It is still just of God. To do that, you understand I'm doing apologetics, right? I, I'm 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 helping the folks in our church. Um, I'm I'm trying to strengthen their belief in in what God has said and that it's true and that it's trustworthy, right? Um, this is one of the the, the thorniest subjects in apologetics. Um, probably the single most difficult subject in all of apologetics is the problem of evil, right? Um, does anything in ministry involve the problem of evil? Do you ever have to uh, uh, minister to folks who are wrestling with, why if God is good, am I going through this? Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is, it, Almost every ministerial um, uh, difficulty that we face is some version of this, right? And, and, and so the, the, the basic point I want to make, if we talk about the practical use of apologetics, um, I'm biased because I'm an apologetics guy, but there's a part of me that wants to say almost all of real ministry is some form of apologetics. What, what we are called to do as ambassadors of Jesus Christ is to call people to repent and believe what God has said. And we're doing it over and over again. We're doing it to believers. We're doing it to unbelievers. And so if you understand what apologetics is, you start recognizing that apologetics is ministry. And there really isn't, it's not something I pull out of my backpack in specialized situation when I happen to be talking to one specifically obstinate unbeliever, right? That's what we think of when we think of apologetics. Like, I'm sitting in a coffee shop with, you know, some young college student who's a biology major and, and, you know, he's, he has uh, read all the atheists and he is uh, wanting to just uh, go at me for, for, um, you know, whether Christianity is true or not. And we're thinking, okay, that's apologetics, but it's also apologetics when I'm teaching a Sunday school lesson and I'm trying to explain how this text actually makes sense. 
right? It's apologetics when I'm sitting by the bedside of, of, of a, a sick person in a congregation and reassuring them that God is still in control and God is still good in spite of their circumstances. And, and I am trying to strengthen their faith and get them to continue to be faithful, right? Um, but, but, well, Kenneth, it's a good question, but the reality is there is a, there is a question there, right? When the, when the, when the, um, you know, when, when a person's faith is faltering because he's just been diagnosed with cancer, the implicit question is, it is the, does the biblical God, is God all good? Is God in control if I really have cancer? right? There's an implicit question in all of these things. When someone reads the account of the Amalekites and, and, and says, I, you know what, I'm a little troubled about that. That doesn't seem fair to me, right? There, there's always an implicit question. And, and, and we, we do this sometimes without thinking about it, right? You're doing sermon preparation and, and you're wa- working your way through the text and you're kind of thinking, what questions would people have about this text? And it's not just questions like, what questions do they want answered? But what, what, what objections are they, you know, what, what questions come up in their mind that cause them to resist what this text is calling them to? <clears throat> yeah, it, 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 that, that, that's, that's very much the case. Um, yeah, we, we all tend to unbelief. Yeah, right. That's exactly it. I mean, this is so, um, you know, one of one of one of my go to verses on sanctification is is when the when the man comes to Jesus and says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Right. I mean, th- this is where we are as as believers. God, I believe. But but there are times where what I see right now, what I see with my physical eyes rather than seeing with my eyes of faith seems overwhelmingly convincing to me, right? It does, it, you know, you, you, this is Ecclesiastes, right? Here's Ecclesiastes, the, the, the guy who writes Proverbs and all of this wisdom looks up at the world around him and says, man, there are times where it seems like the truth of Proverbs doesn't bear itself out in the real world, right? You know, that, that, that here I'm looking... You know, here's a natural disaster that hit, and it, it appears to entirely be indiscriminate as to whether it levels the houses of unbelievers or believers, whether it levels um, uh, um, uh, buildings dedicated to iniquity or buildings dedicated to worship, right? It doesn't seem to matter. And why should I remain faithful in a world like that? Right. I mean, this is this is real life ministry. And, and so, yeah, I mean, there there's a there's a, a, a specialized definition of apologetics that we know it when we see it. You know, here here's a guy on a debate stage with an atheist and he's, you know, point by point answering objections. Or here's a book that you give to someone that is, OK, answers to common questions, common objections to Christianity. Like that's very specialized apologetics. And I, I, don't, I don't disagree that that's very obviously apologetics. But if we understand that, that um, uh, as, as uh, Joel pointed out, frames definition, uh, uh, biblical truth applied to unbelief, and that unbelief is something that obviously the unbeliever is characterized by, but that the believer still wrestles with. then we, we recognize that apologetics is immensely practical, right? And the, and the things that you've been studying over these last several weeks, um, let, let, let the, the, the roots of those just kind of spread throughout your entire view of ministry, that, that um, you, you shouldn't try to keep apologetics in this, in this sort of airtight container of what I do when I'm talking to a particularly obstinate unbeliever. But I'm doing apologetics in my Sunday school lessons. I'm doing apologetics in my sermons. I'm doing apologetics. You know, one of the things, one of the things I do at our church here, again, because it's small and, and, and we're able to do things like this, is um, we have a, a kind of a morning Bible study time. We have a morning service. And then, and then some of our folks, not as many perhaps as I'd like, stay for lunch. 
And then afterward, we have an afternoon service. And our afternoon service, the, what I, what, the first thing I always do is, does anyone have any questions about anything I taught this morning? And uh, it's a wonderful way to put yourself on the spot every week, right? Um, to, to, be, to be ready for, to, to, to give answers. And, and there are a lot of times in that afternoon service um, that we don't get to what I plan to do. It's more like another Bible study, to be honest, than it is a, a formal service. Um, but there are a lot of times we don't get to what I, what I have uh, planned for the afternoon because we just start pursuing questions. That sort of open forum, being ready to 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 help help give people the information that they need, so that in their minds the truth of God settles for them. Right? They listen to the morning sermon, but they have this one nagging question that they can't figure out, and that whole thing doesn't settle because they can't figure out this one part. Right? I mean, you've experienced this. You're wrestling with the text yourself. And you've got this one verse that's like, I just don't understand how that verse fits here. And so I don't know how to take this passage. That work is a work ultimately of apologetics, in a certain sense of apologetics. Does that make, does that make sense? Um, and, and so I, I was in the process. Yeah, oh, abs yeah, th this is, um, I, I I, I couldn't agree more with what with, with what Joel just wrote there. The the the, the idea that um, apologetics is is I, I do apologetics a lot for me. Um, and and um, strengthening my own faith. Um, it 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 is something obviously I hope to use in specific instances talking to unbelievers, but it's something that um, strengthens my trust in God. And that I want to use to strengthen the, the trust in God of, of the folks in our church. Um, and so it, it is, it's enormously broad. I, I want you to look at an example of this. Turn to Titus 1 this morning. Titus 1. We're going we're gonna to spend our time in, in uh, a handful of, of um, uh, passages this morning. And, and our point isn't going to be to do a full exposition of each of these uh, it may be in the same way we would if uh, this were an exposition class. We're, we're going to try to focus on um, certain principles that are, are being taught here. Um, Titus 1, um, you can see in the, the middle of the chapter, beginning in verse 5, you've got these uh, qualifications for an elder. And, and I just want to skip to the, the last one here. Um, the, the bottom of it, verse 9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. You see, that's, that's apologetics, right? Um, keep, keep reading because he gives the reason for this. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced. And this is important. Um, how are they supposed to be silenced? So let me, let me ask, and, and, and I, I want you to just kind of um, uh, think through this. When Paul says that the false teachers must be silenced, how is it, well, let's see, what is Paul not saying, telling Titus to do? What, 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 uh, what is he not to do to silence them? It's a great, it's a great point, Peter. Well, how, I, I, I want you to think of it, and I want you to type in, when, when Paul tells Titus, silence the false teachers. What is he? What action is he not telling them to do to silence the false teachers? What What is an illegitimate way to silence a false teacher? Yeah, shooting them, right? Um, Paul is not saying to physically silence them. That, that makes sense, right? I mean, that's that, 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 yeah, no, or or just ignore them. You know, uh, turn your head the other way and hope they stop it. Right? Um, silencing them, Paul is not saying 
jail them or beat them or shoot them. How do you silence a false teacher? You refute them. You demonstrate that they're wrong. Right? Does this make, do, you, do you understand that the, the command that Paul is giving, yeah, the, the, the command that, that, that uh, Paul is giving to elders, to uh, ministers of the gospel, is that when false teachers arise, they are to be silenced because, um, yeah, you're asking, no, that's true. When they, when they show up in your church, that, that's, uh, that's very much the case. I had one instance of that here where a couple guys walked into one of our services and decided to, uh, to try to confront me as I was teaching. And uh, yeah, that was interesting as well. Um, let, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading that. They must be silenced, verse 11, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Um, and then he goes on to, to talk more about this. Uh, this last, um, yeah, I, I did. Like, I, I, I get that experience. Um, it was a it was a small thing here, but it's very very uncomfortable. Um, this last Sunday in our church, um, I'm preaching through Matthew right now, and we came to the passage in Matthew 23 where Jesus t- says, um, "Don't call any man teacher." Right? It's a really interesting passage. I I. Uh, I read the passage as part of my morning preaching, and, and then I, 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 I told our church, okay, and since Jesus said we're not to call anyone teacher, uh, that concludes this morning's sermon. I folded up my Bible and pretended to walk out of the pulpit, right? Um, and, 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 and really what I had to do then is explain, give an apologetic for why I'm teaching when it seems like Jesus says, don't call anyone teacher. Right, I, I had to I had to explain that text, and one of the things um, uh, that that I pointed out is the New Testament is full. The epistles, especially, are full of commands to teach sound doctrine and to refute false teaching. Right, I mean this is this is a major theme of the epistles. Um, I actually pointed out that what, whatever Jesus means by don't call anyone teacher can't mean don't teach, because just a couple chapters later, what does Jesus say just before he ascends back to heaven? Go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them, what? Teaching them everything I've commanded you, right? And then you turn over just a couple of chapters into Acts 2, and it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' Teaching the Apostles' Doctrine, Acts two forty two, um, and and so I, I think the point of don't call anyone father, don't call anyone teacher, um, don't call anyone rabbi is not the titles, nor is it obviously that you're not supposed to have teachers, but it's they shouldn't be like the Pharisees, right? You, if you're in ministry because you love people recognizing you as your te- as a teacher, as a esteemed spiritual leader, find some other line of work. Right. That in Jesus, in Jesus um, uh, church, um, yes, there are to be teachers, but you're not supposed to be revered as though you're on another. It, it shouldn't be. Let's let's be blunt. It shouldn't be that when someone who is a teacher in Christ church walks into the room, he wears all the garments that signify his high estate of office and people bow to him and kiss his ring. Right. Um, that is exactly the sort of thing that Jesus is saying shouldn't characterize his church. Um, But anyway, the point I want to make here is how extensive it is in the New Testament. It it absolutely does exist. I I made the point not not only that not only does that sort of thing exist in 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 Roman Catholic circles, it certainly exists in megachurch ministries, and it exists in certain fundamentalist um, uh, traditions with the man of God and, you know, you don't touch the Lord's anointed and, you know, here's my parking spot and my, my $500 suit. And, you know, you, you just, I'm on a different level than you. Um, you, you, you can, and you, you can make this work in just about any form of Christianity and it's appallingly bad in all of them. Right. Um, but the point I want to, I want to stress here is, is 
how, how uh, pervasive a theme it is in the New Testament that what we do in ministry is, is teach sound doctrine and refute false doctrine, right? And it happens over and over and over again. And, and our refutation of false doctrine should be so extensive that we silence it, right? Um, <clears throat> Um, and, 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 and this is this is ministry, right? And this is apologetics. This is practical ministry here, um, and it's it, it's done not in in some dry academic sense, right? Um, this is something I I want to I want us to stress that if we understand that unbelief is not merely something rational. Right. Um, when we're doing apologetics, obviously we're dealing with arguments and rationality. We're dealing with sort of an academic bent on things. But one of the things I've stressed when, when, when we did our session on the theology of apologetics is that the unbeliever ultimately doesn't reject God because of rational reasons. The unbeliever ultimately rejects God because he is a rebel against God. Right. Um, let me read. Let me read something to you. Um, um, Greg Bonson. It's a name you it, it should be maybe familiar with. He's done some helpful things on apologetics. Um, if you've never listened to, he has a debate with an atheist named Gordon Stein. I don't know if I referred to it in in one of our earlier sessions or not. Um, but he a debate between Bonson and uh, an atheist named Gordon Stein. Um, it's available online. I I know there is at least one a uh, ministry. It's called Covenant Media Foundation that claims the copyright on it. So while you can find it on YouTube, um, I don't think it's there legally, though I I don't know that. Um, but anyway, the Bonson Stein debate very very helpful. Um, Bonson was a student of Cornelius Van Til. Uh, is that the transcript of it right there, or or like a, a recap of it? I just have audio, um, so I leave, <laughs> leave it with our conscience. No, it has audio. Yeah, it, the got it. Um, so so it is incredibly instructive. There is another debate, and I I think this one is also available on Covenant Media Foundation. Um, um, of Bonson and R.C. Sproul um, doing a debate. And it's a debate on apologetic methods. So uh, the last class we had on, on views of apologetics, different approaches to apologetics. If you want to get a little deeper into the weeds on that particular question, um, that's a really interesting debate to listen to because Sproul is defending classical apologetics. Bonson is defending presuppositionalism. Um, and this was recorded years and years ago, but you've got these two brilliant men brilliant, faithful Christians uh, debating apologetic method, and they're doing it in, in, a, in a good spirit and everything. I, I want to read an excerpt from that debate, the Bonson-Stein debate. And, and this is from Bonson's opening statement. And he makes this point here. Um, he says, apologetics is not mere persuasion. Um, here, I'll, I'll put this here so that you guys can read that as I'm, as I'm reading it. Apologetics is not mere persuasion. Much of the popular literature in the area of theistic and anti-theistic apologetics consists of highly polemical and emotional efforts at converting others. And to be sure, it is often our duty to seek to convince others of our position. I mean, that's, that's what we're doing, right? That's what we're out to do when we're doing apologetics. Sadly, however, these efforts too frequently take a form that substitutes psychological persuasion for careful and fair argumentation. There are ways of persuading people to take a position that are not legitimate, right? Um, we, we talked about, you know, how do you silence the unbeliever? Well, you point a gun at him. Okay, well, that'll silence him, but it's not, you know, that's, it, it, it's con you've convinced him to stop talking, right? But that's not, a legitimate form of persuasion here. Both believers and unbelievers are guilty of this, at least in my estimation. 
For it is a sad fact of life that logically poor arguments are often psychologically effective in convincing people of the truth of a position. It's very, very much the case. Conversely, good arguments can be psychologically ineffective. And we may consequently find ourselves confronted by a moral dilemma when we discover that certain bad arguments and glib slogans will be found more convincing by a larger audience than what are, in fact, really good arguments. And then this next point, I think, is really profound. And when we, on top of this, judge the issue that is being disputed to be one of high importance in our lives, right, um, the stakes when we're doing apologetics is, is an eternal soul, right? The stakes couldn't be higher. And so the temptation when the stakes are that high is to use whatever means possible to convince someone, right? Um, <clears throat> and when we, on top of this, judge that the, the issue to, uh, being disputed is one of high importance in our lives, such as in the case of apologetics, we are especially tempted to put these bad arguments in the service of the truth. The Christian apologist ought to be the one person on earth who will resist this temptation. For we only dishonor the truth and ultimately dishonor the Lord of truth when we use fraudulent and suspicious forms of argument in promoting the truth. So in the first place, apologetics is not mere persuasion. We may persuade a lot of people to become Christians on the basis of very bad arguments. But our task as apologists is to find good arguments. One will not be found later to be fraudulent when somebody with greater intellectual talent comes along to investigate. Um, some of you may be familiar with um, a little book by a pastor named Mark Dever. <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 certainly, I think that's, um, I think that's a, 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 an important idea there. Um, Mark Dever is a pastor of a Baptist church in Washington, D.C., yeah, I, I, that's exactly where I want to go, John, uh, moving those good arguments from head to heart. Um, Dever wrote a book called The Gospel and Personal Evangelism, um, a help, helpful little book. And one of the things he does in that book is, is he says, we need, to, we need to rightly define evangelism. So the question here is, uh, how can you determine when you have evangelized someone? What is the what is the the, the mark the, the the tell the evidence that you have done evangelism? What's the criteria for judging whether you've done evangelism? Yeah, I think that's a really, really good answer, Phil. Um, the temptation, yeah, that, that's, that's great. The temptation, um, and Endeavor points this out, is to think that success in evangelism, I have successfully done evangelism, if someone gets converted, right? I mean, that's, that, that's how it's, it's easy for us to think that way, is um, I, I succeeded in evangelism, that person got converted. But, but what's the problem with that definition? What, what is the, what is the uh, danger of, a, of defining event, success in evangelism by conversion? Yeah, the, 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 the getting uh, close to the idea is I don't have control over conversion. Right? I don't have control over conversion. Um, and this is when, when we probably when we come back in the second hour, I, I want to spend our time in Second Corinthians and the passage that I asked you to you guys to to look at this week is um, um, the the temptation in ministry is to measure success in ministry by the results, right? Um, uh, that that I am successful in ministry. If I get results, if people are converted, if um, uh, the church grows, if, if whatever it is. And, and the same thing bleeds into apologetics. I want you to see the connection between what I'm saying now and what Bonson just said. Um, that we can persuade someone to become a Christian on the basis of bad arguments, right? Um, 
uh, and, and you see this throughout church history. I mean, there are, there are people who come to saving faith, sometimes on the basis of really, you know, really bad arguments, sometimes on the basis of really dodgy evangelistic techniques, right? I mean, are, are, peop, were, are people sincerely converted to Christ? Sometimes by ministers of the gospel who have compromised their ministry in extraordinarily awful ways? And the answer is yes, right? Um, I, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of ways in which, in which the Christian ministry has been deeply perverted. Yeah, and, and in this, right, in as much as Christ is preached, we rejoice, right? Um, but, but but there are absolutely, I mean, we, um, I, I don't want to go down this, this, this whole rabbit uh, hole here because it's, it's, it's a deep one. Um, but you, you look at a ministry of someone like Billy Graham, right? Um, and Graham's um, compromise of his ministerial associations, right? His um, uh, willingness to extend ministerial fellowship to Roman Catholics and to liberals. I think it's a serious, serious compromise. Um, I think it's a serious compromise. And yet, Billy Graham has probably preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to more people than anyone else who ever lived. Right? And, and there, are, there are thousands and thousands of people who were genuinely converted under his ministry. And, 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 and so the temptation sometimes is to say, uh, again, because of the stakes, because of the value of an eternal soul, um, there is a temptation to say, hey, whatever works, right? And, and, and this holds true to uh, our, our apologetic te technique. Hey, listen, the, here, are, here are arguments that I know aren't actually fully good, but I know they work. Right here, you know, I'm going to throw out this design argument, and I know there are problems with the design argument that I'm hoping the other guy doesn't notice because most of the time people don't notice and it works. Yeah, it, 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 uh, certainly under compulsion, but dubious arguments, absolutely. Um, there's all kinds of approach to ministry, and 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 I want you to see the connections then between. Um, uh, and, and, and again, when we get into it in the, in the second hour, everything that we're going to look at in, in um, uh, uh, Second Corinthians here, but this, what we are called to do in practical ministry, in seeking uh, to uh, bring people to grow in, either to come to faith in Jesus Christ or to grow in faith in Jesus Christ. Um, our approach to apologetics is going to be relevant to our approach to all of ministry. Right. If we are if we are fine with a sloppy and um, uh, a whole filled approach to apologetics, um, that's going to bleed over into the rest of our ministries. Um, yeah, th this is exactly it. And, and so giving giving disciplined thinking, you, I, I'm, I'm really appreciating your guys comments here because because you, you guys are getting the connections here. A disciplined approach to apologetics that says, I need to be faithful in proclaiming the message, in using arguments that are sound and biblical, um, um, uh, declaring forthrightly the authority of God, right? Because I'm here just as a messenger of the authority of God. I, I don't think that um, you know, just a little bit more information and someone, um, you know, that's all someone needs is they, they just need a little bit more information and they'll come to Christ, but rather they're being called to a whole souled repentance. This theology of apologetics is practical ministry, the practical use of apologetics. Um, yeah, again, there's, there's, there are all kinds of manipulative ways of convincing people. And, 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 and I want you to see that they're of a piece, right? Um, a manipulative apologetics and manip manipulative ministry, they're, they're, they're all in the same thing. Once you understand that any time I am seeking to convince someone to continue to believe what God has said or to come to believe what God has said, that I'm doing a form of apologetics, 
um, you, you, uh, that this is practical use of apologetics, right? This is practical use of apologetics. Um, let's look at one more passage. You've probably looked at this one. Um, Joel, I forget. Do we take a five-minute break or a 10-minute break? Usually we take a five-minute break. All right, so I'll go for five more minutes here. Turn, turn to the uh, apologetic uh, life verse passage. This is uh, 1 Peter 3.15. Um, this one gets um, this one gets cited all the time, obviously in, in apologetics. Um, but I, I I want you to see it here because um, I want to talk about it from this perspective of the practical use of apologetics. First um, Peter three. We'll begin in verse thirteen. We'll begin in verse thirteen just to get the whole paragraph here. <clears throat> now, who is there to harm you? If you are zealous for what is good, and I, this is this is amusing to me. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, do you see the tension between verses thirteen and fourteen? Who is there to harm you? But even if someone does harm you, right? I mean, it, it, you know, Peter Peter covers both sides, and I think we get what he's saying here. You cannot ultimately be harmed, right? Um, as, as someone who will be vindicated by Jesus Christ in the last day, no one can ultimately harm you if you are zealous for what is good. But in this life, they will harm you, right? I mean, both of those are true. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them. Nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy. Always being prepared to make a defense, that's an apologetic in Greek, to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. One of the things that we need to stress, and we'll, we'll come back and talk about this more after the break, when we talk about the practical use of apologetics, the focus tends to be on being prepared in your brain to give answers. Um, uh, who will want to harm you? Ah, uh, maybe. I'd have to. I'd have to consider that. I. I maybe. I, there are times I like the new living, but I'm, I don't know that I'm convinced of who will want to harm you. But anyway, one of the things I want you to see in this, this passage is that um, an apologist is not called merely to be ready in his mind, but that the apologist must have a certain character. And, and you see it here. You, you, you also see it. Um, uh, you know, we talked about throughout the New Testament, you see these instructions where Paul writes to Timothy, writes to Titus, and tells them to refute false doctrine. But one of the things he almost always says is, um, take, take care of your own character, right? Be such a person that your character is unimpunable. And, I, and you see that here in this passage, right? Um, I think it's really interesting. I'm, I'm preparing to teach another apologetics class in, in, in January at, at uh, a seminary in, in, in Minnesota. And um, I, I'm having the, that class read through a variety of apologists through church history, starting with Tertullian, right? And, and, and uh, Tertullian's defense of Christianity begins with the defense that, hey, listen, I know you've heard that Christians kill babies on the altar and eat them, but that's not true. <laughs> um, I know, I know the, the rumor is that Christians have these incestual um, uh, sexual practices in their religious gatherings, but guys, that's not true, right? He actually begins with the defense of the Christian's character. I think that's very consistent with what Peter is telling us here, that being prepared to give an answer for the hope that is in you begins with taking heed to your Christian character. Um, 
you can have all the arguments in the world. If you deliver them in a ungracious way, you are not properly giving an answer for the hope that is in you. Uh, I want, and 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 I, I hate to cut it off here. I mean, this is this is when we need to take a break. I want to pick up with that when we, when we come back, um, uh, because it's it's such a vital point. So let, let's take our five minutes. We'll come back, and I want to pick up with that that point about the the, uh, the apologist character. It's great, excellent. Okay, uh, I got some amens coming from over here. Let's take a break for five minutes. So, I, wow, I mean, you planned this. We've got five till, and um, let's just come back right on the hour, and we'll continue there. Thanks. Um, I I think I mentioned in in previous um, uh, previous classes. I like debate. Um, I enjoy arguing. Um, it's I, I, I get a kick out of it. Some people don't like it, but I love batting ideas around. Um, e e even in a, in a friendly way, uh, there's been times um, when uh, Joel has been uh, at my house and will stay up till all hours of the night uh, batting ideas back and forth at each other um, and, and, and finding like, nuances of, of things of uh, where we might even have slight disagreements just to hammer through ideas and sharpen one another. I enjoy things like that. One of the problems um, with that, one of the, <laughs> uh, apparently, uh, apparently I don't win every debate I'm in. Um, but one of, one of the problems with taking a class like this and, and, and being loaded up with all of the arguments for the truth of Christianity uh, and I, I've, I know I've used this phrase before, is, is we can have a tendency to want to win the argument rather than to win the math. Um, and this, this gets into this character, um, the character of the apologist issue um, that I think is immensely important. That when we're talking about practical ministry, practical apologetics, um, <clears throat> especially when we're talking with an unbeliever, um, what we are saying to him is unavoidably offensive, right? Um, that that to tell an unbeliever, right, right, in order to get someone mentioned the Uangalian, the, the good news, before you could get to the good news, where do you have to start? We well, always have to start with the bad news, right? Um, and in many cases, you have to establish the bad news. And the bad news is you're not right with God. And there's nothing you can do to fix that, right? Uh, and those two truths are immensely offensive, is God doesn't accept you the way you are. And you could try as hard as you want, and you can't get God to accept you. There's, you you're in such a hole, you can't dig your way out. Those are profoundly offensive statements to most people, right? They, they cut to the heart of people's pride. Um, what I have found is, is when you are dealing with a topic in which you have to tell people things that are intrinsically offensive, it, did I get disconnect? No, okay, I heard a beep. Um, it, it, it helps a great deal if that person that you're talking to is convinced that you want what is good for them, right? That you have established with them a character of, in a non-sentimental sense, in a biblical sense, that you've established with them a character of love. Right? That when I'm sitting down at the table with this person, that what, what they, they might be want to dispute with everything that I say, right? But what they shouldn't be able to dispute is that I care for them and I want what's good for them, right? Um, that, that they can't look at me. Um, uh, let me, let me, uh, let me uh, back up and say it again this way. I mentioned the Bonson-Stein debate earlier. And um, 
one of the things Bonson does early on in that debate is he says, here are the things we're not debating, right? You know, in, in, the, in the question, uh, uh, does God exist? He says, we're not debating whether Christians always do good things. Because this happens, right? You, you start defending Christianity to someone and they say, well, what about the Crusades? Or what about, you know, the Christians who did this or the Christians who did that, right? And what Bonson's doing is he's trying to cut off that line of attack. That's not relevant to the question whether Christianity is true or not, right? Um, the fact that Christians are sometimes jerks. Christians are sometimes mean. Christians sometimes do bad things. Isn't intrinsically relevant to the question, is Christianity true? And so Bonson tries to just cut off that avenue of attack. On the one hand, I understand why he's doing what he's doing, right? On the other hand, it's, it, I think it's worth realizing that biblically speaking, Christian character matters for Christian defense of the faith, right? That, that um, when you look at a passage like this, one of the things that Peter is telling us is as we defend the faith, our character should be such, our actions should be such, that our character, our actions aren't drawing our Christianity into disrepute, right? That, that, and, and, and this is why Tertullian begins his defense of the faith by trying to vindicate Christian character, right? It is that if Christians are moral monsters, Christianity becomes indefensible. But it should be the case that people, when people slander you, Peter says, that their slander has no basis. It's, it becomes evident to all people that those who are slandering you are just making stuff up. It should never be the case that when, when people raise moral objections against your character as a Christian, that those, those moral objections, this is why the pastor, when you look at the qualifications for a pastor in Titus and the qualifications for a pastor in Timothy, the vast majority of them have to do with the pastor's character. Right. Um, so that, yes, you, you know, if you're loaded for bear and or, you know, you've got all the arguments for here is sound doctrine and I'm able to refute those who contradict sound doctrine. But your character is out of line. You are an unprepared apologist. One of the marks of that and, and um, I, I, I I, I love this passage. Obviously, that always be ready to give a, an answer, always be ready to give a defense in 1 Peter 3.15. This verse gets cited in every single apologetics um, work. Um, but I think it's worth pointing out, um, what are the circumstances? So it, look, look at the text, 1 Peter 3. What, what are the circumstances that cause unbelievers to ask about your hope, right? Because that's, that's what Peter says. Uh, be prepared to make a defense for anyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you. Why would an unbeliever ask about the hope that is in you? What, what is it that would give rise to an unbeliever asking about your hope? Okay, that, that's true. Um, that's also true. It's, it, it's still a, maybe a little bit too broad. Um, yeah, there's a difference beha in behavior. Um, okay, these are, these are all true answers. That's getting closer. The whole context, the whole context of, of well, well, uh, all of 1 um, Peter is written to Christians in what kind of circumstances? It, it's suffering, right? The, 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 this is, look at back at verse 14. Even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense for anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Yeah, hope 
is a, is a really important biblical word. Um, this isn't this isn't a strict theology definition. This is more of a preaching definition. But but I I, I tell our people hope is faith in the future tense. Right? Bibli- biblically, um, hope is what it is that I put my confidence in for my future security. Right? What, what it is that I am relying on to deliver me in the future. What do unbelievers put their hope in? What, what, is the, what kinds of things are the foundation of the unbeliever's hope? Wealth is, is a absolutely huge one, right? This is, um, uh, wealth is, is something um, that uh, has obvious benefits, right? If I have money, does it provide me a measure of security against uh, future hardships? And the answer is yes, right? I mean, if, if, if I have a significant Amount of money in the bank, I am insulated from certain kinds of problems harming me. And so people put their confidence in, in, in wealth. Um, they put their confidence in family and friends, right? Um, that, that if I surround myself with people who love me, when hard times come, they will see me through them. Right, and so relationships become something that unbelievers put their hope in. Um, people put their hope in their health, and so they're very, very um, uh, careful about what they eat or how they work out or things like this because this is their uh, uh, their um, buffer against uh, future hardship. Religion is another one, and I I use all these things as, as I, I want to say these things because what you see that I want you to get this. As Christians, especially Christians that are being persecuted, sometimes our health is taken from us, right? Or our finances, or all of the things that would give us security in this life. Your, your, your friends turn away from you, or family uh, abandons you. And, and when you remain faithful in those circumstances, the unbeliever is going to look at you in amazement and ask about the hope that is in you. Does that make sense? That's the context of the unbeliever asking about your hope, is, is when the, the things that the unbeliever puts his hope in, right? When the things that the unbeliever banks on for his future security, when those things are taken away from the Christian and the Christian is able to continue on, they're going to ask, how in the world do you do that? Because where, where is your hope located, right? They do, and, and that is the circumstance in which you should be able to give a reason for the hope that is in you. In this way, I want you to see character, faithfulness as a Christian precedes and is foundational to. It is, it is a deeper level commitment than just having really good arguments. Right? Practical apologetics. Is, 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 a, is first and foremost a matter of your character, right? Um, that, that, that when you live faithfully, not giving up on the hope that you have as a Christian, those are the things that cause unbelievers to question your hope. Um, I, that one I don't know right off the top of my head. Um, is that uh, even if, yeah. That, but the, the hope of the resurrection, certainly, absolutely. Um, and, and, and so I want to I stress this point, is, is that practical apologetics is often, um, you know, there, there, there are useful books on this. Um, there's one, uh, Greg Kokel has written a book called Tactics, right? Um, that's, a, that's a useful book. 
If you if you're looking for a, a, another book, I, I believe his name is spelled like this. The book is called Tactic. Um, that's a useful book for how to actually engage in conversation. And and I would I would encourage you to read things like this. But when we talk about practical apologetics, biblically speaking, one of the things I, I want you I want you to see is that is that when, when Paul tells you about being ready to give an answer, when Peter tells you about being ready to give an answer, the first thing he's stressing is your character and your your personal faithfulness. Um, not consistency, faithfulness, but faithfulness as in you continue to trust God, right? You continue to believe God. Um, and, and that is very much being stressed here in this, in this uh, sort of core passage on, on apologetics. Um, I had... Something that came to, oh, I, I, I want to get to this. Let's, let's look at 2 Corinthians. I want to do two more things this morning. Go to 2 Corinthians, and, and we're, right, well, first I want you to see why, um, so, sort of the structure here of this passage. I think some of you are already familiar with this. <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and we'll actually talk about some of that, put a stone in the shoe kind of stuff at the, the, the end here today. Um, so second, I, this is, I have, I have men in my church that make fun of me um, because I'll, I, I would say about the passage we're going to look at, this is one of my favorite passages, but I say that about a dozen different passages. And so they make fun of me for having so many favorite passages. Um, but this, this for me is, um, it, it's one of Paul's most extended rabbit trails. Um, I, 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 so again, some of you, some of you are familiar with this. I want you to look at Second Corinthians two first, and and look at verse twelve. Paul says, "When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. Now." Skip from there all the way over to chapter 7. Chapter 7 and verse 5. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. Now, if, if you're paying attention there, what, you, what you'll see is you could, you could uh, take scissors, don't do this, and cut out everything from 2.14 to seven four, and the passage would just flow, right? You you see that there, there's a direct link um, between um, uh, two thirteen, two twelve and thirteen, um, and 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 seven four. Joel's trying to get there. There we go. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so I took leave of them, went on to Macedonia. Seven four. Instead of seven fourteen, there we go. Hold on, what's going on here? Oh, seven five, got it. There we go. All right, we we got that figured out there. Um, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there, so I took leave of them, went on to Macedonia. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. You you see, there's a, there's a I mean, it's a direct flow of thought. What that indicates is that everything from 2.13 to 7.4 is, is Paul going on a bit of a rabbit trail. He's, he, he goes off topic a bit, and he goes off topic for four chapters, and they're wonderful chapters. Um, so so uh, go to 2.14, <clears throat> and, and he, he presents now this... Um, this metaphor, but thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. And so what Paul wants us to picture is, as he's doing his missionary journeys, uh, as he's going around, even as he's troubled, what is really happening is that the risen and ascended Christ is leading his followers on a, on a victory march through the whole world 
spreading through the world the fragrance of Christ, then he's going to say, for some, that fragrance is attractive. It is the fragrance of life. It would be very similar to what Jesus says back in John, my sheep hear my voice. And then he says to the religious leaders, you do not believe because you are not my sheep, right? The, the idea is as we go on this victory march, spreading the aroma of Christ, as we go out proclaiming the message, there will be some who hear, and because they are the people of God, they will come and be drawn to that, and they will come and receive the message. There will be others that hear what we're saying. They smell what it is that we are bearing with us, and they will be repulsed by that. If you get that core metaphor, um, this gets back to what we were talking about earlier, that our mission is to faithfully bear that message. Our mission is not about making the result, right? And I want you to see this especially in chapter 4, right? 2 Corinthians Four. This is in the middle of this extended digression of Paul on what it means to be a, uh, um, a, a messenger of Jesus Christ. So um, uh, starting at the, the beginning of the chapter, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. This is, I want to camp here for just a second. So I mentioned this other class that I'm, I'm, I'm teaching, this other apologetics class that I'm going to be teaching. Um, so after, after we read and discuss Tertullian, we're going to read and discuss uh, Schleiermacher, right? Anyone know who uh, 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 Friedrich uh, Schleiermacher is, what, what he is known as? He's considered the father of something. Anyone know what Schleiermacher is considered the father of? Yeah, he's considered the father of liberal theology. Yeah, liberal theology. Um, so Schleiermacher's writing, I, if I'm remembering correctly, in the 1700s. And his most famous work, his most famous work is, is called uh, On Religion, um, Speeches, Let's see, to its cultured despisers. <laughs> I love that. Liberalism. Um, that's, that, that's amusing. Um, <clears throat> nice. Um, so <laughs> trying to recover here. Um, so Schleiermacher is considered the father of liberalism. And he's writing this book on religion, speeches, speeches to its cultured despisers, those uh, elite of his society in his day who are increasingly disdainful of Christianity. Here's the thing I want you to get. Liberal theology is embraced with good intentions, right? Liberal theology is embraced with good intentions. We often think of um, theological liberalism as an attack on Christianity, a and it is, right? It, it ultimately is. So by liberal theology, um, what we mean uh, is, is uh, a, a, a surface allegiance to Christianity, someone claiming to be Christian. But in Schleiermacher's case, what he wants to do is empty Christianity of all its supernatural claims, right? You can be a Christian without necessarily believing in the, re the literal resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He's saying that. I want you to get this. He's saying that not because he's trying to attack Christianity, but because he's trying to defend it. Right? In other words, Schleiermacher's liberalism is a form of apologetics. If you don't think of it as apologetics, <laughs> oh great, now we're doing comics. Um, um, what is this, good, good intentions here? It's, it's loading. 
I, I may have made reference to this in, in, in previous classes. I'm not sure. Um, there's an American pastor who's, um, yeah, in, in, um, there's an American pastor who's, who's uh, gaining a, a measure of um, uh, no, uh, notoriousness. Uh, his name is Andy Stanley. Uh, some of you may be familiar with him. Uh, his, his father is Charles Stanley, who for many years has been a faithful preacher of the gospel. Uh, Andy has a giant multi-campus megachurch in Atlanta, and, and he has, um, he's been um, sort of controversial recently for um, uh, using the language that as Christians, we need to unhitch Christianity from the Old Testament, right? So if you're familiar with church history, there's a name for this. It's called Marcionism. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's an old heresy being recycled. Why does Andy Stanley want to unhitch Christianity from the Old Testament? Well, it's because the Old Testament has a bunch of stuff in it that he thinks is an obstacle to people coming to Christ. It has things like uh, Marcionism, um, Marcionism. <clears throat> um, the Old Testament has things in it like all the Canaanites, right? Or all of the obscure Levitical laws. Um, it, it, it's got things in it that are difficult to understand, that are very, very foreign to us. Obviously, you've got the creation account in there that, that for many scholarly people, they consider an obstacle to belief in Jesus. And what, what Stanley says is, listen, I'm just concerned that people come to Jesus and if the Old Testament is an obstacle to that, we need to unhitch the New Testament from the Old Testament so that people can come to Jesus. Um, in, in this way, um, Stanley is basically uh, just an updated version of a Schleiermacher, right? There is, a, there is always, and, and this is, uh, I'm looking forward to the class that I'm teaching because I'm going to go through Tertullian and Schleiermacher and then modern apologists like uh, Lewis and Chesterton and Van Til, and then, and then contemporary guys like Lee Strobel and Tim Keller. And, and, and here's what I want you to think of um, in, your, in your own case. We sit down with an unbeliever and we want to present the gospel to him. And we need to be especially watchful in our own defense of the faith for what we're willing to sort of bracket off and set aside in defense of the faith, right? And, and, and let me explain what I mean by this. Let me see. Um, yeah, it is enormously, enormously popular, nor, you know, very successful. And so, you know, from that point of view, it doesn't make sense that you wouldn't do what he's doing, right? I mean, that's, that's exactly how that goes. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about here. Um, there are times um, where you are sharing the faith with someone and they raise an issue in the Bible that is designed to get you off topic, right? Um, where did Cain's wife come from, right? Or they they you know, this objection or that, you know, what about the discrepancies in the resurrection accounts, right? And it is very easy for the sake of argument to say, listen, even if there are certain discrepancies in the resurrection accounts, the, the, the gist of it is there. Okay, now now here's... Is there a time where it may make sense to say something like that? Maybe. But what is the danger of saying something like that? What, what have you just come close to giving up? What, what belief, Christian belief, do you come close to giving up where you say, well, yeah, maybe there are discrepancies in the resurrection accounts, but I want you to focus on the main thing here. Yeah, you've given up inerrancy. 
right? In your situation, whatever it is, your context is different than mine. You are seeking to communicate the gospel to people who have certain beliefs, certain issues that are important to them. And there is always a tendency to um, present the gospel in a way that has the least um, uh, objection. For Schleiermacher, that meant getting rid of all supernaturalism out of the faith, right? Um, I'll, I'll be honest, with, with a guy like Tim Keller, some of you may be familiar with Tim Keller, others not. Um, Keller is a, a, a fairly well-known American pastor in New York City, pastors a Presbyterian church there, has written a couple of uh, very useful books on apologetics. One is called The Reason for God. Um, Keller is very well regarded by, you know, some of the cultural elite of America, right? He's, he, you know, uh, national public radio in, in America, sort of, you know, center left, um, mainstream American, well regarded, well cultured. You know, Tim Keller is like the apologist for NPR. And what that means is he has to be very careful in how he articulates certain Christian commitments, for instance, on biblical marriage. Because if he, if he says certain things really, really strongly, that crowd's just going to reject him. Do you understand walking that tightrope? is a very dangerous thing for us as apologists, right? I, I, I want you to see this battle that we're, we're, we're facing as apologists, is as apologists, we need to know the audience that we're speaking to. This is the whole battle of contextualization, right? I need to know the audience that I'm speaking to and what objections they have to Christianity, what, what, what um, concerns they have. And, 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 and when we do that exercise, okay, who are, who are the people that I'm ministering to them? What, what concerns do they have? What objections do they have? Um, our tendency sometimes is to figure out where they have objections and soften the objections of the Bible in those points. And it, and it, and it happens in every age and in every culture in different ways. Here, Paul says, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And, 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 and the, the question, Paul, well, how do you dare to do that, Paul? Isn't that going to reduce your effectiveness, right? That's the question. Paul, if you do ministry that way, if you're so blunt in doing ministry, isn't that going to cost you converts? And Paul says, verse 3, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. Now, obviously, there's a, there's a set of theological commitments that undergird this. There is a robust commitment, and, 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 and this is important to see. Um, Paul believes I think very clearly here in a passage like this, that there are those who will believe, and there are those who will not believe. And God has always known who those are. And that is fixed. Now, that doesn't, I want you to be clear on this, does that make Paul not evangelize? And the answer is by no means. I mean, Paul is the most zealous of all missionaries in the, in the history of, 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 of Christianity, right? Um, and, and so it's not an excuse for not evangelizing in any way, shape, or form. But what Paul recognizes is because God has those who are his, right? You, you have that uh, famous passage in Acts. Um, where Paul is being harried for his proclamation of the gospel, and, and, and God comes to him and, and tells him to take courage, I think is with, with reference to Corinth, if I'm remembering correctly. It could be another city. I could be wrong. And, and God tells him, 
you know, take courage, Paul, for I have many people in that city. And that's really significant because at that point, there isn't a Christian church there yet. Right. But what God is saying is there are those who are mine because I have ordained them from before the foundation of the world. They're there, Paul. Take courage. You're going to go find them. Right. That in this in this context, election is a spur for evangelism. It is not a discouragement of evangelism. Right. Does that, that make sense? And in the same way, then, if we are convinced of this, if we are convinced that there are those who belong to God, and it is our obligation to go do the work of evangelism, to do the work of apologetics, and to find them, what we realize is, if we are faithful to God's method, those who belong to God will come. And here's the reality. We're not going to make more elect people by compromising the message. Right. If if we if we believe what Paul says here, I can, with open statement of the truth, proclaim the message of God faithfully. And I know those who belong to Jesus, those who are his sheep, will hear his voice and they will come. And I if 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 I think I can get more sheep by compromising the message, I don't understand ministry at all. Right? Theologically, I won't make more sheep. Oh, and, and, no, no doubt. And there's, there's, a, um, there's a lot we could talk uh, about there, John, in, in, in terms of, um, of a ministry method. I'm, I'm here just, just saying, in our proclamation, in the, in the proclamation itself, I'm, I'm not getting into ministry methodology more broadly. Um, but but what, what I am saying here is we, we cannot shave off the rough edges of, of God's revelation in the hope that we will create sheep that God has not ordained, right? Um, this is, I, I, did, did we talk about Paul and rhetoric in Corinth in this class already? Is that is that something we talked about when in, in when I was uh, oh it, it, it's 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 worth seeing this um, there's a lot more we could say in in, in Second Corinthians but go back to First Corinthians really quickly I, I, this is this is worth paying attention to um, First Corinthians um, I. Uh, I, I love these opening chapters of 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 first corinthians um, in in terms of uh, ministry methodology um look at verse eighteen um pick up in verse eighteen for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see that's the same sort sort of thing that we were talking about in second corinthians right um that there, there are these two groups of people that God has ordained, um, and and you know them by their response to the message. Um, for it is written, "I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart." And then Paul issues this taunt: "Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Have not God made foolish the wisdom of the world?" For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, and please God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. And then this is really interesting. Verse 22, for the Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. Okay, what does it mean that the Jews uh, demand signs? What, what does Paul mean when he talks about the Jews demanding signs? What, what are the Jews looking for, according to Paul? Yeah, that, that they're looking for a coming messianic, powerful um, conqueror, right? That that's what the Jews are looking for, right? And the Greeks seek wisdom. We understand that the Greek love of of, of wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. Now, here's what I want you to see, and I think this is I think this is really really important. So the Jews are seeking a mighty conqueror, 
Is Jesus a mighty messianic conqueror, according to scripture? Careful with your answer. And the answer ultimately is yes. Right? Now, so here's the thing. Could, and, 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 and I'm, I'm gonna, if I were teaching some sort of uh, contemporary class on missiology, all right, uh, Paul is sitting in the class and I'm saying, okay, Paul, consider your target audience. What are they looking for? Um, you're preaching to Jews. They're looking for uh, the, 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 the mighty conqueror who will go, he's going to come and establish justice all over the world. That's what the Jews are looking for, Paul. Is Jesus what they're looking for? And the answer, of course, is yes. So Paul preach Jesus as the coming messianic conqueror, right? Uh, Paul, look, the Greeks are seeking wisdom. Is Jesus wisdom? And the answer is what? Yes, right? Jesus is wisdom. Jesus is, is, is perfect wisdom. And so I want you to get this. From a merely human point of view, it makes absolute sense for Paul to preach Jesus as signs to the Jews and as wisdom to the Greeks. But instead, Paul knows what his audience wants to hear. He knows what will be most effective in drawing a crowd and drawing a crowd to Jesus. And he does what? The exact opposite of that. He preaches Jesus crucified, weakness to the Jews, and folly to the Greeks. Right? Jesus examines his audience. Oh, absolutely, right? In, in other words, he's not, Paul is not going to take the unbelieving assumptions of his audience and use that as the framework for determining how to preach Christianity. Does this make sense? And this is, this, this, is, this is apologetics, right? Everything we talked about in terms of approaches to apologetics and, and, and um, not allowing the unbeliever to set the terms of the proclamation of the message. This is why, uh, biblically, I would say, we must avoid that kind of thing. Uh, turn to chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, um, in, in, in verse 1. <clears throat> and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power for the purpose that, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The, the idea is, is, could so the, the, the Greeks love wisdom, and I think here uh, Paul is appealing to the idea. The Greeks loved rhetoric, right? The art of speaking. Do you think Paul was capable of pulling off Greek rhetoric? Did Paul have the training and the capability to do Greek rhetoric if he, needed, if he wanted to do it? And the answer is yes. Would that have drawn a bigger crowd of Corinthians and gotten Paul a better audience for Jesus? And the answer, from a certain point of view, is yes. But Paul knows that any ex I want you to get this, any extra people that came because of rhetoric wouldn't be coming because of Jesus, and therefore they wouldn't be true converts. Right? If, if you change the message, if you alter the message to make it more appealing to your audience, the extra converts you get are converts to Jesus because they're not hearing the sheep's voice. They're hearing the rhetoric. Right? And, and so our approach to apologetics, where, where foundationally what we're doing is going out and proclaiming the authority of God, and the necessity of believing what God said, ultimately because God said so, right? Again, it's not to say that we can't appeal to evidences. We ought to appeal to evidences. We ought to appeal to arguments. But at the end of the day, we bring the unbeliever face to face with this 
issue. You refuse to submit to God because you want to be God. Right? If we don't get there, um, we're, we're, we're departing from the apostolic example here. Right? That practical apologetics, we take heed to our character and we take heed to being diligent in the defense of everything that God has said, not shaving off the rough edges so that we get a greater hearing. And it's a perennial temptation for the apologist to shave off things that the unbeliever will find offensive so that they'll come. And, and, and we don't have the authority to do that. That's not – our calling is to proclaim the message, not to modify it. Right? All right. Um, we, have, we have about 15 minutes left. Let me, let me uh, do one, one last thing here, just in terms of practical uh, apologetics. Um, so one of the things I stressed uh, earlier – in 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 um, our um, or in the earlier classes that I was here, um, practically speaking, one of the most important things that you need to grasp about doing apologetics is that it is not you as the Christian alone who has to give a defense for your position. Right? We talked about the problem of burden of proof. Right, and that very often. Uh, when we're doing apologetics, when we're actually in that conversation, the assumption that everyone works off of is you as the Christian have the burden of proof. If you don't prove your case, the unbeliever is right by default, right? That's how people think, right? You sit down and you're trying to convince someone to be a Christian and sort of the, the, the un, unstated assumption of the conversation is if you don't, if you as the Christian don't prove your case, they're justified in staying where they are, right? Like they're the default setting, you're asking them to change, and so you've got to prove your case. And what I argued earlier is that one of the single most important, uh, um, really practically, massively significant things you can get is that the unbeliever also needs to account for his own position. Right. It, it is it is it is absolutely legitimate for you to, in parts of the conversation, turn the tables back on the unbeliever and say, listen, I know you don't believe Christianity. So how do you account for on your uh, uh, worldview this or that or the other? Right. Does that make sense. Right. We've talked we talked about that before. Practically speaking. Um, yeah, it is not self-evident. It is not the default setting. It is not justified just by being there. They have to give account for things. Um, what that means practically in, in a lot of cases is um, you have to help the unbeliever understand his own worldview, right? And, and again, you guys, um, uh, you know, many of you are coming from very different cultures. Um, than, than what we have here. But, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think we've exported a, a lot of our culture. America is a very, very entertainment-based society. Um, uh, people um, basically spend every moment that they can where they're not working, just seeking to entertain themselves. What that means is that, for the most part, the people I talk to aren't people who sit around asking themselves the deep and hard questions of life right? What that means is that, at least for me, most of the people I talk to don't have a worked out worldview, right? They've never, they've never really thought about their worldview. And, and in practical conversation, then, if I'm pitting the Christian worldview against their worldview, in order to make that conversation work, there are times I have to help them understand their own worldview. Right, that they've got like these vague uh, convictions about how things are, but they've never tried to systematize them at all. And 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 honestly, practically speaking, one of the things that you can do in apologetic conversations um, that that's really helpful is force the unbeliever to systematize his own worldview and see the inconsistencies in it. Right. 
What are some questions to ask the unbeliever to help him understand what his own worldview is? What are, and and this, this, is, this is sort of where I want to wrap up, is what are some basic questions that define what, a, what someone's worldview is? What would you ask someone um, if you wanted to establish what their worldview is? Okay, what, what, what is the purpose of life? That's a really good question. What else? Yeah, so um, in, Christian, in Christian theology, we have what we would call a protology and an eschatology, right? So eschatology is our doctrine of the end times, right? Protology is our doctrine of origins. So as Christians, Hey, where did we come from? Well, the answer is we were created, right? Um, before us, there is God, and God has created us by his word for his glory, right? And in the end of all things, our eschatology, right, our, our, our broad eschatology, not getting into all the details of the timeline of eschatology, what is the most essential element of Christian eschatology? right? Like Apostles Creed level eschatology. What is our most base? Yeah, that Christ comes again in judgment and he separates the, the, those who are his from the ungodly and punishes the ungodly forever, right? And, and rewards those who are his. In the, so, so that's our basic protology and eschatology. Um, what is, what, what, what sounds like Rick Warren? I'm sorry. Those, those are fighting words, man. Oh, what are you here for? Well, it, 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 it's a, <laughs> um, yeah, that, 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 uh, what, what is your purpose, though? It, it, you know, it, obviously, you could take this in bad directions, but um, that, that is a worldview question, right? What is life all about is, is, a, is, is, a, is a, a worldview question, right? What, is, what are you there for? It is worth asking these questions of unbelievers, right? So take, take your generic atheistic unbeliever, right? What is his protology? What is his doctrine of origins? In the beginning, there was <laughs> chance. Yeah, in the beginning, um, you know, the, uh, oh, I forget, I forget who this guy, uh, what, what, uh, what guy this is. Um, uh, uh, Peter Krauss uh, wrote a book called, I haven't read it yet, uh, A Universe from Nothing. Um, uh, and, and, and what he has to end up d d defending is the idea that non nothing is actually a kind of something. Um, Right, but but he's he's wrestling with this question of protology. Right, we have nothing, we have chance, we have matter and motion and chance, and 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 all of that nothing somehow becomes an orderly something. What is the eschatology of atheistic naturalism? What is the eschatology of of atheistic naturalism? Um, yeah, in a sense, chaos. Yeah, it, it's it's you know basically all uh, mass entropy. Right, the suns burn out. Everything gets cold and dark, and nothing. Right. Um, that's his protology. That's his eschatology. Now, here's the question: If that's the universe we live in, wh why does it exist? Right. Well, ask the Rick Warren question: What is the purpose of anything in that universe? And what's the answer? The answer is that. Th there really isn't a purpose, right? We're just matter in motion doing what we do at this temperature and pressure. And, and, and you need to bring the unbeliever face to face with that. And, and I know we talked about this uh, earlier in our um, uh, discussion of apologetics, but come back in 40 days. <laughs> uh, nice. Um, nice. 
I want you to see if if they if they um, wrestle with this this question that the universe is from nothing and to nothing and for nothing, then their life is ultimately really about nothing. They can pretend it's about something, right? But it it, it really isn't. It really isn't about anything. Now here's a question. Does the unbeliever actually believe that? Does he believe that that life is purposeless? And he doesn't. Why doesn't he believe that? Why why doesn't he believe that life is purposeless? Because he's what? He's, He's an image bearer of God. Because he's an image bearer of God, he doesn't believe that. He when he sits down at the coffee table with you and is having this discussion. He believes that the conclusions that we come to in this conversation matter, but they don't matter if he's right, right? And, and so one of the most practical things you can do is ask the unbeliever about his own worldview. And, and, and I would just say, practically speaking, uh, our temptation when we sit down with the unbeliever to do apologetics is to, is to start talking. And I think practically speaking, one of the best things we can do is ask questions, right? To get the unbeliever to think about his own worldview. Where did we come from? Where are we going? Um, and and, and a, a word that I go uh, to over and over and over and over again um, as sort of the core of my apologetics is the word ought, right? Um, People believe the world ought to be a certain way, right? Um, They believe you ought to believe what is true. You ought not believe what is false. Um, You ought not um, uh, arm wrestle them into believing Christianity, right? You ought not pull a gun on them and say you need to convert or die. um, You know, that that, that politics or whatever uh, ought to be, yeah, you know, whatever it is, whatever the moral claim is, uh, global warming, um, uh, wh- whether they're on the right side or the wrong side of whatever issue, uh, being an image bearer of God is unavoidably wrapped up in the question of oughtness. And the question for the unbeliever is, where does ought come from in your world? Right? For for an especially for an unbelieving atheist, ought is a is a is a concept that has no foundations. Right? It it has no weight. Um it's 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 personal opinion backed up by force. And and that's all it can be. And 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 yet they reject that idea. Now in a Christian worldview, in a Christian worldview, well they they do claim that oughts don't exist, but they don't believe it. Right. They don't believe it. Right. Because because, um, you, you know, it, it, this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, one, one of my favorite questions that I, I, I often have when I teach apologetics and, and have an essay question. Yeah. Um, is is um, ask the unbeliever, why shouldn't I punch you in the nose? Right. And, and and give me a coherent answer to that. Well, it would cause me pain. Yeah, but you, you have to understand, it, it, it causes me so much pleasure to punch people in the nose that it outweighs your pain. Right? Um, well, it's illegal. Well, yeah, but you know what? You have heroes that, that are your heroes specifically because they did something that was illegal because they were in in allegiance to a higher moral principle. So you don't believe that legality and morality are the same thing, right? And and whatever thing they would appeal to, um, um, yeah, whomever it is, you know, their their appeal to their moral foundations, none of them will hold except for this. We live in God's universe and God declares what is moral, and he will ultimately do justice, and the immoral people don't get away with it, right? When, when, when Hitler died in a bunker, you know, the, you know this, this, we, we, there's a, we're out of time here. There's a scandal in the U.S. that, that um, it, uh, the, the trial has already happened. There was, a, there was a doctor at Michigan State University 
who was the team doctor for the, the United States women's gymnastics team. And over the course of years, he, he uh, morally abused um, dozens and dozens of, of, of young women who were, who were gymnasts. And um, he was sentenced to, to life in prison, essentially. The reality is, even if he is put to death, which I think you could make a good case for the death penalty in that case, does that make up for what he's done to all of those girls? And, and, and there's a very real sense that that's not, we, can, we can't obtain justice in this world. And yet our heart longs for justice because we're image bearers of God. And, and, and so I want to sit down with the unbeliever and, 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 and validate who he is as an image bearer of God, right? You really do believe that there are moral oughts in this world. And your heart cries out for justice. Because you're an image bearer of God. You think, you think things ought to be a certain way. And that the way things are is broken. Your, your heart there is actually saying what you believe because you're an image bearer of God. But you can't have those things on your own worldview. Right? I want to ask him questions about his, his own worldview. And this is that stone in the shoe idea that Greg Kokel mentions. I, I am trying to pit him against himself. I am trying to pit the unbeliever as image bearer of God against the unbeliever. Um, here's his worldview as he articulates it. And so I want to ask him questions about his own worldview and show that his worldview doesn't account for who he is as an image bearer of God. Right. And, and practically speaking, that's probably the biggest advice that I could give. I mean, I wanted to focus here on this biblical content about the kind of people we ought to be and the, 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 the um, uh, per perpetual temptation that we have of sanding off the rough edges of God's revelation, because I think those are real, real issues in practical apologetics. But, but, but in, in sitting at the table, um, practically speaking, one of the biggest um, uh, counsels I would give is ask questions. Get the unbeliever to articulate his own worldview where he begins to see for himself the inconsistencies between what he says he believes and what he actually believes as an image bearer of God. And show him, okay, your worldview just collapses on itself, right? What you want is actually found over here. But here's the catch. You can only get it if you bow the knee to Jesus Christ. You, you can't get it as a rebel, right? The call is to repentance. The call isn't just to mere rationality, though I believe Christianity is the only rational position. But the call is to repentance, right? So um, sort of a grab bag uh, lecture today, a, a, a variety of things. Um, oh, sorry, lost my earpiece there. Um, you know, consider these texts about how we do ministry, and 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 I think it, I think it's helpful having taken a class like this to start seeing much of your ministry as apologetics. Um, that that in that way, I don't think there's anything more practical. Um, all right, uh, you you have my email address. Um, if I, I I haven't done a real good job of leaving time at the end for questions, but. Um, there's my email address again. If there's uh, anything you want to ask, uh, get in touch with me. I'm happy to to take those questions. It's been a joy to be with you guys. Um, um, I've appreciated it. I uh, appreciate Joel giving me this this opportunity. Um, I've enjoyed the, the the comics and the snide remarks as well. Um, so uh, thank you for for allowing me to to be with you guys for this these these weeks. Thank you. It's excellent. Just really, really helpful thoughts all around. Um, I'm going to make a comment here as we go out. Remember, just a reminder, please go and give me your questions as uh, you're thinking about the course so that I can start preparing answers for our final lectures. I love this closing emphasis on asking questions, listening. We go into the, uh, the opportunity to witness and we're so eager to share what we're thinking that we're not even listening. And so some of the best clues that we can possibly have in the conversation about how to address this person in the worldview, they're saying to us, 
and we're too busy interrupting because we want to jump in with what we're going to go after. So being a listener, asking questions, and then actually allowing what they're saying to collapse in on itself. Great. Excellent. Thank you very much for these three sessions, and uh, we really appreciate your time here. Okay, uh, to all, we will see you again next uh, week. I think the word that I got out of your chat was that we will go ahead, some of us, and come in on Monday, and then others, if you wanna just watch it uh, on your own time, feel free. Okay, good night to all, thank you.